Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll discuss firefighting policy and procedures in the wake of yesterday's tragedy in Yarnell. And we'll have an overview of the U.S. Supreme Court's just completed term. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. It's the worst firefighter tragedy in Arizona history and the worst in the U.S. since 9-11. A wildfire near the town of Yarnell claimed the lives of 19 firefighters yesterday, leaving the state and the nation in disbelief and mourning. Jim Paxson was the face and voice of the Rodeo Chetiskai fire that ravaged Arizona forests in 2002. He's currently with the Arizona Game and Fish Department and joins us now. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. And this, is, this is a rough time for you um, uh, for a variety of reasons, and I want to get to that in a little bit. But let's start with what happened. Well, there was a, a number of crews out there, and uh, the Granite Mountain hotshot crew from Prescott was digging fire line on a portion of the fire. And we don't know exactly what happened. An investigation team is going to look into exactly what happened and how. But we do know that uh, the fire burned over that crew very violently, very quickly. And they deployed their shelters, and some may not have even got into their shelter. Those are big kind of pup tent looking uh, metallic and uh, Nomex structures that you get into and pull down around you and they're like a big kite when the wind's blowing so we have 19 fatalities and we're just we're very sad and very grieving. Those tent structures, uh, those fire tents basically are, they're told what just dig a, a, as much of a hole as you can lay down and wait? How does that work? No you're supposed to clear any burnables away if you have time but you get into them and uh, they reduce the heat 80 to 90 percent from what's outside the shelter. And you can be in them 10, 15 minutes with, with no problem. I think uh, the heat was just so extreme and it happened so fast that the, the injuries were very rapid. Were they uh, on a hillside in a clearing? Talk about the terrain. Well, the terrain is broken and uh, I don't know exactly, Ted. That's a lot of the things that will come out in the investigation. Uh, they were on the edge of the fire and they were building from a, a safe anchor towards the head of the fire, building fire line, digging line. When you say towards the, digging a fire line toward the head of the fire, does that mean if, if, if I'm digging here, the fire is this way or the fire is this way? You're actually flanking the fire, but you go from a safe point that's, that's kind of cold and uh, you start building your line and as the fire moves up the hill, you actually flank it and try to pinch it off. There were others on the other side of the fire that were digging line as well. And in cases like this, and again, we're not, you're not sure exactly what happened, but in cases where the wind shifts, is it basically we're working here because we know it's coming this way and then just like that it comes this way? We, we do know that there was thunderstorm activity in the area and there were what they call outflows, really hard gusty winds, 40 to 50 miles an hour. And if they had an outflow come across that fire line and bring fire over them, it was quick and extremely violent. So quick that we hear that maybe some didn't even have a chance to get into their fire tents? We'll find out, but I, I believe that's the case. It's, it, talk about the hotshot team itself. What is a hotshot team? Well, there's two kinds of crews, and uh, there's type 1 crews. There's only 112 of them in, in the entire nation. They're 20-person crews. They're... Uh, the most physically fit, the most trained, the most experienced. They work together about nine months a year. They're family. You know, they go to these fires. Uh, they become expert. They dig more line than the other kind of crew, a type two crew, which is a crews that we use in our Native Americans and, and, uh, and some forests and organizations put crews together. But they organize for the fire and then they disorganize and disperse when they get back from that fire. Hot shots live with each other. And sometimes though they work eight, ten years on a hot shot crew with their buddies. Yeah. And and they go hunting with their buddies and they go bicycle riding and, and skiing in the winter, whatever they do, you know, I mean it's a very tight, close family. And obviously they had to have been working relatively close together, correct? Or or, or not? A lot of these hot shot crews they, they build lines so fast that if I've got a tool, I'll hit a lick. So I've got a digging tool, I'll hit a lick, 
and I'll move three or four feet. And then the next guy hits a lick next to that and next to that. And by the time you get to 20, it's a trail with all the vegetation removed. Sure. And that's how you keep the fire from crossing that trail. So they they have such teamwork and such dedication and and they all work together. It's there it's a marvelous machine. The nature of this fire, it sounds like chaparral grass, this sort of thing. Talk to us about the fuel here compared to the fuel in a, in, in like a rodeo cheddar sky fire. Well the rodeo cheddar sky was forested, there were meadows and such, but this is a chaparral type. You know, there's some pinion juniper. Uh in the draws there's heavier fuels, there's uh, cat claw and mesquite and palo verde. There's a lot of oak, the shinri oak, and a lot of uh, of uh, mountain mahogany. Uh, I just had a senior moment. Uh, there's a waxy leafed uh, plant that, when it gets really dry, yes, it it burns extremely hot. Looks like an oil field fire. Manzanita. Manzanita, yes. Yeah, and we had good winter rains in that country, so some of the grass was two feet tall and it's thick. Grass carries fire because it burns easily. So a combination of fuels, real flashy, fast-moving fire. Uh, are they, can they be more dangerous? Uh, certainly they behave differently, don't they? They do. Uh, desert fires are extremely fast. Uh, that country in Yarnell hadn't burned in 30 or 40 years. Uh, a lot of times a, a chaparral type will burn every 10 or 12 years. We're in the 20th year of a drought. Uh, extreme record-setting temperatures, less than 5% humidity, gusty winds. It's a recipe for a perfect disaster. The, uh, the a federal incident management team apparently either is investigating or will investigate. What do they look at in a situation like this? It's much like a criminal investigation. In fact, Yavapai County Sheriff's Office actually did the evidentiary photography. They went in there so that they could remove the bodies to get those young men uh, properly taken care of and down to the medical examiner's office. They probably took thousands of pictures because once you move those bodies, that evidence is disturbed and you can never get it back. Uh, the investigators that will come in all have extended fire experience, extended science background, a lot of research on how and why fires burn. Uh, there's uh, even some weather folks and some uh, social scientists that will be looking at this thing so they can try to reconstruct what happened see what went wrong and, and try to have it not happen again. Is there a chance that everyone will look at this, that procedure, standard procedures were met, that everything was done as best as humanly possible, but the simple fact of nature caused this and there's not much man can do? Well, yes and no. You know, on the Dude Fire in 1990, we lost six firefighters. Uh, the first one down to those firefighters and discovered the first fatalities was so touched and so driven that he came up with what we call LCES, Lookouts, Communications, Escape Routes, and Safety Zones. That became almost Bible to the firefighters. You had to know which way you went to get to a safe zone and where it was. You had to know your communications with your crew and with the overhead and with command. You needed to have a lookout on probably both ends of where you were working to spot and tell you when fire was approaching and trouble was coming. Uh, we've made such technological advances that this investigation will help firefighters because we're going to try to see that uh, what happened on the Yarnell Hill fire will not happen to another hotshot crew. And we should mention that uh, we have a couple of uh, websites here for those who want to uh, help firefighters' families uh, because, again, uh, everyone's kind of looking for something to do. This, as we mentioned earlier, this is a shock to the system for everyone. And for you personally, this has to be rough. I spent 33 and a half years fighting fire with the U.S. Forest Service. I'm still a firefighter. And, uh, you know, this just took the wind out of me. I'm, when I found out, uh, I shed tears. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I was on six fatalities in my career. I hope not to see a seventh. And, and here we are. Nineteen lads went to work Saturday morning. None of them came home.
Well, Jim, we thank you for your time and especially the information, and let's hope something, some kind of information from the investigation comes from this so that we can keep something like this from happening again. Ted, thank you for having me. Thank you. You bet. The United States Supreme Court released a number of blockbuster rulings in the final days of its most recent term. ASC Law Professor Paul Bender is here with analysis of the High Court's session overall. Good to see you again. Thanks nice for joining us. You, uh, your thoughts on the term? Well, they really weren't blockbusters except for one of them. Uh, the first thought that comes to me is people thought the last week of the term there were going to be these three big cases, gay marriage, the Voting Rights Act, and affirmative action uh, programs in universities. And there was only one really big important decision, and that was the one that held a part of the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional. Otherwise, the court ended up not really deciding big things, especially with regard to gay marriage. The thing that I was looking for this term, and that I think most people are looking for, follow the court, was you may remember at the end of last term, Chief Justice Roberts, who usually sides with the conservatives, broke with that and wrote an opinion with the four liberals on the court upholding Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said, does that mean that he's becoming more moderate, that he is going to be the center of a, a coalition so that will break down the blocks that have been on the court? And this term, we thought, would tell whether that was going to happen or not, or whether that was just an aberration, and he really was a solid member of the conservative bloc. Well, the answer is he really is a solid member of the conservative bloc, and that kind of moderation is not happening. And you can see that most in the case that strikes down Section 5, essentially Section 5, of the Voting Rights Act, which required, uh, and still requires, uh, cover jurisdictions to submit any change in their voting laws or regulations to the Justice Department before they go into effect. It still requires that, but the court said that the, the formula that was used to decide who was covered and who wasn't was unconstitutional, so you can't use that now. And uh, yeah, you know, I, well, let's, let's stay with the preclearance. Yeah. Exactly what did the court look at and what did the court decide? The court looked at the formula which uh, the statute sets up to say which states are covered and which states aren't. And it's a very strange formula which turns on how many people voted in the presidential elections in 1964 and 1968 and 72, whether the jurisdiction has used tests or devices and things like that. And the court said that formula is outdated. It should have been updated by Congress. And because Congress didn't update it, we're going to hold it unconstitutional. Now, that is just a remarkable thing for the court to do. Congress is given by the Constitution the affirmative power and the responsibility, I think, to enforce Section f uh, Article 15 the uh, of the Constitution, which prohibits racial discrimination in voting. And that's exactly what Congress did in the Voting Rights Act. And Roberts said, you know, we know that this stops discrimination in voting. We know that it works. It's just that we would like the formula to be better, more modern. We'd like it to be more finely tuned. The court has no power, I thought, had no power to do that. Congress has the power to do that. Congress is entitled to do anything that it thinks is necessary and proper to deal with voting discrimination, and there's nothing in Robert's opinion that says that this wasn't necessary and proper to deal with voting discrimination. It's that, hey, I would have designed a better formula. That's a really strange and, I think, unjustifiable thing for the court to do, to st stand in the way of Congress when Congress is trying to enforce 
uh, a, a provision of the Constitution which prohibits racial discrimination in voting. Compare the court's actions and how you saw the court's actions with the Arizona voter registration law. Well, our voter registration law, the court held unconstitutional because preempted. Arizona is the part of Proposition 200 which says you need to bring to the registration place, you need to submit affirmative proof of citizenship. And the court said that that violated a federal statute which said you didn't need to bring that in order to, uh, in order to register to vote. But the, the interesting thing about that is at the end of the opinion, that is an opinion that seemed maybe to be a coalition of people because Scalia wrote that opinion and the liberals joined in that. And he said, well, you know, Arizona might be able to reinstate this requirement if they go back to the Federal Election Commission and ask to have that requirement put into the Arizona form that the federal government prepares. And that if the commission won't do that, maybe, he said, Arizona could then go to a court and get that. It's a strange thing for a court to do. And I think it's, it's a s holding out a hope that's not there. Because the test would be, said Scalia, if Arizona can show that they need this in order to make effective their requirement that you have to be a citizen to vote, then maybe they could force the commission to let them do this. Arizona, I don't think, can show that because there's no history of non-citizens voting in Arizona. And so the, the fact that you need to make people bring d documentation, I don't think you can prove that. But at the heart of this particular decision was that basically that Congress regulates right. federal elections, correct? Well, the states regulate it, but Congress can override that regulation. Mm -hmm. And that's what Congress tried to do here. And the whole idea with motor voter was to make it easier to vote, right. and they're saying, wait a second, this is all. They said so Congress is making, uh, Arizona is making it harder, and they're not allowed to do that. And both, obviously, the Arizona registration law, that f impacted Arizona greatly, and even the, the preclearance impacted Arizona oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, now, for example, uh, the redistricting commission has a redistricting uh, scheme, and it w is pending in the Justice Department for preclearance. Well, it doesn't have to be pre-cleared anymore, and now it can go into effect without that. Is it unusual to have these two particular decisions, one in which uh, people leaning left celebrated, the other people leaning right celebrated? Is that unusual? No, it's not unusual. Every year, all, all decisions don't come out in the same direction. There are always some liberal decisions, some conservative decisions. Uh, but to me, the most important thing is that the court is, stands in the way of Congress's attempt to uh, ensure that there be no racial discrimination in voting. And then in the case from Texas involving race-conscious affirmative action, the court stood in the way of the University of Texas's desire to uh, have more diversity in their classes. The court is using constitutional amendments that were designed to give minorities rights and to stop discrimination against minorities. And Congress has done that in the Voting Rights Act, and Texas did that in their Affirmative Action Program. And the court gets in the way of states and Congress that are trying to enforce the constitutional rights of minorities. That's what happened. That's what happened in the Texas decision. Yeah. Right. They stood in the way of that and said, no, you have to go back and give it another look, and it's got to be narrowly tailored and you need strict scrutiny and stuff like that. Why is the court standing in the way of states? The court keeps saying that it believes in state autonomy, and we'll, we'll see in a second they believe in that in the gay marriage situation. Yes. Why get in the way of states that are trying to integrate their societies? Why get in the way of Congress that's trying to ensure minority voting rights? Real quickly, I thought this was a reprieve of sorts, though, for affirmative action. Well, it didn't. It didn't say you couldn't have race-conscious affirmative action, and that's because Justice Kennedy is unwilling to join the four conservatives who want to overrule the case that said that you can't. So, yeah, that's a reprieve in the sense that it's not going to be held unconstitutional, but it's also going to be difficult to do. Uh, and that, the other message of the term, other than that Roberts is not becoming a moderate, is that it's still Kennedy's court. Everything that Justice Kennedy wanted in the end of this term, he got. He's on the winning side of everything, uh, except with one exception, but even there he's on the winning side. So he, in all of these cases, it's up to him to decide what to do. He is willing to permit affirmative action, but he wants to monitor it very closely. He did not want the federal government to be able to say that even though a state recognizes gay marriage, 
uh, still the federal government will not treat those people as married, so that in New York, which is where this case came from, it recognizes these two women as being married, but the statute says that for federal purposes they're not married, so they can't file a joint tax return, they don't get the marital exclusion on the state tax, which is what this case was about, and things like that. And Kennedy wrote an opinion, five to four again, and they're joined by the liberals, <coughs> which is saying <coughs> you can't do that. States have the primary responsibility about marriage. If a state wants to protect gay couples by calling them married, the federal government has no business interfering with that. And he used some very strong language to say that the, the federal government is really challenging the dignity of these couples. He, he mentioned children would be humiliated right. and these sorts yeah. of things, right? the lesser class citizens, the whole, the whole nine yards there. Really strong stuff. So the real question that we're left with now is they did not decide on whether California, California's ban on gay marriage, California the opposite of New York, they want to ban gay marriage, whether that's constitutional or not. And you have Justice Scalia reading Kennedy's opinion in the New York case saying, I know what Kennedy's going to do in the California case. He's going to strike down Proposition that bans gay marriage. And you have Chief Justice Roberts writing in a different opinion. I know what Kennedy is going to do. <laughs> I read this opinion and it seems to me that he is going to uphold California's. And Kennedy is absolutely silent on that issue, says not a word, and yet it's up to him what's going to happen. So they didn't decide that this time because three of the liberals joined with Kennedy and Scalia to say that there was no jurisdiction over the California case because the governor of California and the attorney general of California refused to defend Proposition 8. That only applies in California. And so in other states like Arizona, where the governor would defend that ban, that case is going to come back to the Supreme Court. And if the membership of the court doesn't change, again, it's going to be up to Justice Kennedy. And you read the tea leaves and you have to, I mean, these people know him. They know the subject and they read the tea leaves in exactly opposite directions. Quite interesting. And they will find out eventually what eventually, he thinks about they this. Will find out, yeah. So, in the legacy of this particular court, it, 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 what, what's shaping up, or what are the history books going to write about the last few terms? It's a quite conservative court, but not so. They don't have five really conservative votes. And so it has not been able to, except in some areas, move the court in a really conservative direction. But the court hasn't moved in a liberal direction either. So what you've had for 15 or 20 years is a conservative court that hasn't made any big changes in constitutional law. And once again, they didn't make a big change in constitutional law because they didn't decide the California uh, ban on gay marriage case. So the legacy is going to be a fractured court with four people on this side, four people on the other side. It used to be O'Connor and Kennedy in the middle. Now it's just Kennedy in the middle. And he goes back and forth. And when you read these opinions, you come away with saying, you know, I'm just not satisfied that that was done in a rational way. The opinions often don't seem to deal with what they should deal with, with, with clarifying the issues. And so it's a muddled court. And, and last question, I, we heard that uh, Chief Justice Roberts was concerned about the legacy of the court, the image of the court, the trust the American public has in the court. Uh, should he be concerned? Yeah, I think he should be concerned because I think that this court is not being true to the Constitution in a number of, uh, of respects. The main one that we saw here was in, in minority voting. Rights. And also, just the California case, the people of California adopted Proposition 8 the governor didn't want to defend it, but the people adopted it. And the Supreme Court, in opinion by Justice Roberts, says, too bad on the people. If the governor doesn't want to defend it, it's not defended. A lower court holds it unconstitutional, and there's nothing the people who proposed that could do about it. And Kennedy says, hey, you don't understand direct democracy, which we have in California and in Arizona. The people are allowed to make law. And when the people make law, somebody ought to be there to defend the constitutionality of the law. I found that a really powerful opinion by Kennedy, but it was a minority opinion. Has that ever happened before, to where a state has refused to defend something? Private citizens step in and, the, and the, a, a court says that's not your job? Um, I don't know that that's ever happened before, no, no. Sometimes the federal government will refuse to defend some federal legislation, but they permit Congress to step in and do it, as they did in the DOMA case from New York. Uh, the president thought DOMA is the thing that says that the federal government has to treat these people as not married, even though they are. Uh, that he thought that was unconstitutional, and he wouldn't defend it. But people from Congress 
were permitted to intervene and defend it. Somebody should be able to defend these, or whatever you think about them, somebody should be able to defend them. And the Supreme Court, five to four, over a really good dissent by Kennedy, says, sorry, if the people pass it, but the government officials don't want to defend it, it doesn't get defended. And a one lower federal court judge can strike down what all the people in California decide, and nobody can do anything about it. Wow. That's the kind of legacy that I find muddled. All right. Well, uh, good stuff, Paul. Again, it's, it's, thank you for joining us throughout the term and uh, for the overview here. Uh, I can't wait for uh, I can't wait for next session. Every term is interesting. <laughs> thank you so much. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, hear how Arizona cities and towns will be impacted by recent legislative action, and we'll see how an increase in new car sales is helping drive the economy. That's Tuesday evening, five thirty and ten on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.